as we become more affluent nations and we all live longer, these problems become more and more acute and need solving. And that's what gets me out of bed in the morning. There are three things. One is to make a difference to patients of genetic-based diseases, particularly areas like cancer, which have been served very poorly over the last 30 years because of the lack of understanding of what cancer is. People think cancer is a disease. It actually isn't. It's a, seri a series of orphan-based diseases, in fact, thousands of them. And they're all defined by small numbers of patients in populations, not 100% of patients. And that's where this area of personalized medicine is, is so essential. Uh, and the second is the healthcare economics. It can't take 15 years and three to 11 billion pounds to bring a drug to market, and in a disease like cancer, it will only work in 30 to 50% of patients. In some areas like lung cancer, drugs like ERESA only work for 10% of patients, so the pressure on the taxpayer, on the reimburser, and you as an individual is increasingly going to come to bear. And so there are a whole range of issues there. So my first the reason I get out of bed is to make a difference to patients. The second is to show you can build great companies from the UK. I've been setting up companies for 15 years now. This is my, my 11th, I've been with it since the beginning. And this is a company that's brought technology from America that's had 50 million of funding. We've been consistently exporting over 90% of our products and services and we've gone from IP to IPO in six years. And the third element is making returns for investors. That's the job as a CEO, is to manage investors, make sure that they're looked after along the way, and make returns. And because it is a stock market show, I think I'll talk about that a little bit first, rather than coming to the end. So Horizon raised 9,000 pounds we had in the bank on March 26, 2008, and we go forward six years in one day, and we raised 68.6 .6 million on AIM, and that was based on delivery. During that period of time, we made 32x returns to our investors. We had a single share class from beginning to end. We had private liquidity before we went to the market, so we'd returned seven million pounds to founders and early shareholders before we listed. And at IPO, we returned 28.6 million back to founders. So we've got a consistent track record of delivering returns for shareholders whilst making a difference. So coming to our, our mission, our mission is to become a fully integrated life science company. What I mean by that is we sell products, we sell services, and because our products and services are such high margin and protected by such strong intellectual property positions, and we have knowledge in areas of drug discovery and oncology, we can leverage into that biotech value chain. So getting a piece of those hundreds of millions of pounds of milestones and product royalties for drugs on the market, but without the long development times and investments that are required. And we'll talk a bit about that leveraged part of our business moving forward. And then the area we address is everything from sequencing, so when you sequence patients for their genetic DNA sequences, right the way through drug discovery, development, drug manufacture, and the diagnostic, we supply a product or service to every single stage of that process. Over a thousand customers in 50 different countries. And then we also try to leverage into that value chain to get the jam on top. So what we're about is personalized medicine. We're one of the world's pioneers in this field. You can get the right drugs now, you can develop them, but they tend to be against a smaller number of patients. So you need to build a toolbox of drugs so that when you get a disease, we can sequence it and get your fingerprint of your disease and go into the toolbox and mix and match and give you a combination of therapies that give you a personalized regimen and treatment not the one-size-fits-all chemotherapies or radiotherapies that you'll probably be familiar with. So a little bit of a, you know, we have been pioneers. A number of the examples you gave in your example horizon actually led the change, why the FDA and EMEA changed the labels and made people test for these genetic features. They told the pharma companies, you can't give these drugs to everyone because they don't work, and we're not going to pay for the failure. And a lot of those test cases, cases were based on Horizon's technology. In 2013, we were very pleased to go over to the United States, and amongst 32 competitors in the United States in Silicon Valley, we named the emerging star in the personalized medicine field. Uh, and then this year, we on AIM, we had a good welcome on AIM, and the European Medicine Awards for Public Companies gave rise to the Emerging Star Award this year. So hopefully, I'm going to give you a bit of background on why we've been successful. Our model is de-risked. We sell products and services. Over 10,000 products, thousand customers, everything's underpinned by a very strong patent estate. Our historical revenue growth has been triple digit. And on top of that revenue growth, we've been able to accrue this 158 million of potential milestones plus product royalties if these drugs go to market. And we have no cost to bear on these. 
We invested four million to get there. We've had that four million back plus profit, and all of this is upside on top of the fast growing revenue. So you get some exposure to that biotech upside, but of course there is risk of drugs not making it to market, but we don't have the downside of that. So it's like a windfall on top of the revenue growth. Our technology, which we'll come on to, it's based around editing the genome. In order to do all of this personalized medicine, you have to sequence a patient's sample. You'll be familiar with the Human Genome Project. The first one took 10 years and $3 billion to build. It now costs under $1,000, and you can do it in a couple of hours. When Horizon first came into existence, it was still $10 million in late 2007. So there's been an exponential decline in the cost of that. So you can now sequence everything in there. So that's a real big driver. But what does that mean? You've got all this data, and you've got hypotheses that this genetic variation might mean you or your children will get cystic fibrosis. Or it might mean that you've got a higher predisposition for getting on, early onset cancer and lung cancer because you're a smoker and have lost a particular genetic feature, for example. But how do you test that hypothesis? Well, you can do what pharma has done for the last 30 years, have a rat, have a mouse, but look in a mirror. You're not a rat. You're not a mouse. Or you can take a hamster cell line and put it in a piece of plastic and put thousands of copies of that genetic feature and get a result. But is that a real result? What we do is the exact opposite. We take a human cell line that's derived from a patient and we can go into its sequence, think of it like ones and noughts of a computer code, and think of it like a scalpel. We can go in and edit that code down to a single unit of change. So what you're left with is the normal healthy situation and the one genetic change that you feel is going to be that predictor. So you can now functionally confirm whether that's true. So every researcher who is doing sequencing needs to buy our product. So it's extremely vast. We're addressing all of these markets from sequence right the way through to treatment. They total up to around 29 billion. Our specific addressable market right now, if you work from the bottom in the 72,000 labs that we typically address, is around 500 million for those markets if we sold our products to every customer who could buy them today but they're growing at 20 plus percent growth rates, these markets. Biology 101, you know this, your genetic code is unique. It defines who you are and how you interact with your environment. Small changes in that code determine whether you're gonna get a disease, whether you've got it, what your prognosis is once you've got it, and particularly whether you're likely to respond to a drug that's been developed. Our core engine, the Genesis technology, think of it like a surgeon's toolkit. It enables us to go in to edit the genetic code down to a single one or naught with extreme precision, no off-target effects at all. And you create these tools, these patients in a test tube, the diseased and the normal. And those tools can be used by academic researchers just to understand everything that's going on in the genome. And those exact same tools can then be sold in thousands of different ways, products, services, etc., to help drug discovery and developers get those drugs developed and get them into the right patient populations. This is the continuum, so these are the market drivers that for us, if we look at the first bit, this is now a commodity. You can send that, you don't bring sequencing in-house, you can send that thousands of samples overnight, you get it back the next day fully analysed. The challenge now is how do we convert it into usable things that will lead to drugs and diagnostics to make sure that you, the patient, get a better deal than one-size-fits-all chemo and radiotherapies. We sell products and services into every stage of this process and we also develop the early stage drug programs that are already matched to certain patient populations and the pharma companies then take them off our hands. So Horizon are experts in genome editing and this translational genomics. This is the bit is, that is broken. It doesn't happen like this anymore. 15 years, 3.7 to 11.8 billion to bring a drug to market. You've only got a few years of patent life left at the end, so you have to sell your drug to everyone and get billions of revenues. That's the only way the pharmaceutical industry can sustain itself. And it hasn't worked. So they keep merging, merging, merging to keep the value up. And they target one metric, peak year sales. And that is the wrong metric to be studying for pharmaceutical discovery and development. It should be about return on investment. So the new way you develop drugs, Pfizer with their drug Crizotinib, lung cancer only works in 5% of patients. But they knew that up front using technology like this. And then what they did was instead of doing a 15-year process, they did a seven-year process, but they were only ever trying to get approval for those 5% of patients. So it cost half a billion. They now have 12 years of patent protection. So whilst they're not making a billion in revenue a year, they're making two, three hundred million. The return on their investment 
is significantly higher. So pharma is now starting to look at personalized medicine, not PPS sales, return on investment. So why are so many people adopted in these two case studies that you had on your, on your sheet this morning? This is how they used to do it. AstraZeneca developed a lung cancer drug called Eressa, failed in clinical trials, over half a billion in by the time you fail. They recruit random patients in the hope that they will work for those patients. And in this case, patients who have a particular genetic feature and mutation in a gene called EGFR would, not, would be the only patients who would respond to this drug. Everyone else didn't respond. So when the trial failed, they pulled all of the data together and they just happened to recruit a lot of Asian women in that trial, in trials in China and, and Japan. And they're the people who had that mutation. So this was a failed drug. They then were able to reposition it to these 5% of patients who would respond. It's now on the market. You test patients for that feature and if they get it, they get very good survival times for lung cancer. But that's the wrong way to do it. Our technology enables you to recapitulate that clinical trial. These are the patients that represent the, the 5%. These are all the rest. And we even went further than that. And as this patient responds, they will pick up secondary genetic features that will make them resistant within a couple of years. So we modeled those two and showed that those sensitive patients soon become resistant as they pick up <coughs> secondary mutations. And that drives new clinical trials. So for the pharma company, they want these cell lines, these patients in a test tube, so they can do this work early, so they can change the whole way they do drug discovery. You find out before you've spent 50 million who the patient population is, rather than going all the way to the other end and then being told by the regulators, sorry, you can't give it to those patients. The second one was a bigger case study. You had that on your sheet too. Our scientific founders were working with the big pharma companies. They published that in colon cancer, these drugs called Zetuximab and Vectorbix would not work in patients who had a particular genetic feature, and they represented 40% of patients. They still tried to get approval to give it to everyone, and the EMEA and the FDA said no, based on our data, and then they had to go back, pull all the data together, do new clinical studies, and then the label was changed, and you have to now test patients for their status in this mutation called KRAS. Initially, the pharma companies were up in arms, you're reducing our markets, you're killing us. Two years later, they're championing it as a breakthrough in personalized medicine, and this discovery was named by the American Association of Cancer Research as the breakthrough of the decade in terms of driving change in personalized medicine. Why were they championing it? They made more money from selling it to less patients. And the reason they made more money is people paid more. The American Society of Clinical Oncologists showed that three quarters of a billion in the first year was saved by not giving these drugs at 60 to 90,000 a treatment to patients that it would never ever work for. So the economics argument was very, very strong. So we IPO'd, raised 68.6 million return money to founders. Since then, we've reported on target, uh, on target revenues and various things at the uh, interim report. We acquired an American company called Combinatorics in Boston. They were previously listed on NASDAQ. This enables us to look at thousands of personalized medicines and combine them and look at the best combinations that will work for for customers. That led to an upgrade in the target price from the IPO at 180 to 220. P there, consistently high growth. We're forecast at the end of year by the consensus view to be in excess of 50% growth again this year. And we've strengthened all the various things in, in, in the board. Okay. Just This is what it looks like, so you can physically see. We have cell line products. Once you make these patients in a test tube, we can create thousands of sub-products just by incremental additions of cost and selling them into different parts of the process. We can squeeze the juice out and create 2,000 products here. These are consumables that you sell to the diagnostic companies so that when they're trying to find the patients, the diagnosis is accurate and precise and not called incorrectly. So people buy these reagents from us. On the services side, we engineer the patients in a test tube. We deploy them in all stages of drug discovery, including determining which patients should be selected for clinical trials so you don't end up with these large, long, expensive clinical trials. And then the leveraged upside, it's not like a biotech model. It's not about trying to get billions at the far end. It's about leveraging your IP, know-how, and margin on a select basis to recoup your money, so you invest like an investor. I'll place a four million pound of bets across 20 different programs, and I'll cover my costs by balancing the risk. I'll get that money back, and then I'll accrue, not billions, but I'll accrue 160 million. 
and product royalties if it becomes a drug. So as an investor, there's no more money to spend, and if those milestones come in, of course they're risky, they're 100% margin and like windfalls. And I'll use a case study, our HD001 program. This, again, shows you the economics. Developing a target that has never been drugged before. Everyone wants to find a drug against KRAS. It's mutated in 40% of all cancers, 90% in, in pancreatic, which is why no one has ever come up with a treatment to effectively treat pancreatic cancer. So it's the holy grail of the pharmaceutical industry. We used our technology to develop this very rapidly. We spent less than a million in 18 months, and we partnered it with AstraZeneca, and we got more than that up front, $73 million in in, fee, in milestones, and then 3 to 5% tiered product royalties if it goes to, mar goes to market. And that won the Scrip Awards, the Global Pharmaceutical Industry Licensing Awards Deal of the Year for Horizon and AstraZeneca. And if you bear in mind, we're not a drug development company, we're a picks and shovels company that tells you how good our picks and shovels are. 1,000 customers, here are the top ones, all the big biotech and pharma. Historically, when we went to IPO, if you think of it as a pyramid of value, Horizon is exclusively sold into the pharma and biotech. We're now starting to disseminate into the academic sector. So the thing that was an elite thing, doing this genome editing for very expensive costs for pharma and biotech, we now put it in a box. And we start shipping it out to all of the academics and all the related products. And we built this culture of academia. No one ever owns a Horizon product. When they pay us to make it, we own the product and we can then make revenues on it. We give lower prices to academia, but in return they have to return all of their products, and so we get academia, thousands of labs there doing our product development as well and bringing that in. Much like um, a company called Abcam, our lead investor in Horizon is uh, Jonathan Milner, who's the CEO of Abcam, which is one of the best performing AIM companies, well over a billion dollars in market cap. And then we're increasingly in this next phase, selling into that academic base, that's where we get that extra scale. Last slide really is on the board. Some very seasoned ex executives. So you've got Jonathan Milner, who's CEO of Abcam. He's the biggest single investor. He invested seven million pounds to Horizon, and he's sitting on six, seven times that in, re in, re in return. Ian Gillen, former CEO of Axis Shield, a very successful diagnostic company in the UK. Susan Gale Braith is the global head of oncology for AstraZeneca and the senior vice president of drug discovery at AstraZeneca. She's on the board. Susan Sell, CEO of Imperial Innovations previously, uh, who would have invested in a lot of companies, including Circassia this year, a biotech that floated and raised 230 million on the market earlier this year. Richard Bellicott and myself lead the company. I don't think Richard's in the room, but Richard, a life scientist who then went into finance before, before coming to us. He was the VP of finance at Cambridge Silicon Radio. So it's a billion pound revenue per year company. A lot of experience in M&A, acquiring NASDAQ listed companies and integrating them. So Richard joined us a few years back. My background, I have an interesting background, I left school at 15. I played professional sports for six years, not very well. I ended up going back to school and to university in my 20s. Ended up doing a PhD at Cambridge and a postdoc, and then I've been setting businesses up since those. Mostly organic businesses that don't raise venture capital, they just return profits and dividends to shareholders. Verizon was a, a, I wanted to try and keep that going. So the first couple of years we were profitable rather than the loss-making biotech model. And so when we eventually brought in private equity capital, we were all in a very strong position, so we were able to maintain that ordinary share structure, which has enabled us to build the company that we want to build. So just finishing up, uh, why you should look at companies like ours. Find a company that's got people who've got passion and want to make a difference. And we want to show the Americans that you can build great companies here, bring their technology their investment back over here, export all the products back, start buying their companies, and let's build by organic and a combination of M&A, you know, a company that's going to be the life technologies of Europe. And that's my pick.